Good morning and welcome to Comet Corner. This is a new virtual series created by the UT Dallas Office of Research and in partnership with the schools across our campus to host chats with some of our notable alumni and hear how they have taken their research out into the world and made an impact. My name is Enrica Ziller, Research Education Programs and Outreach Manager in the Office of Research at the University of Texas at Dallas. As we move through today's session, I invite you to post questions into the chat box for our guest speakers to discuss. Here to guide our conversation and introduce our distinguished alumnus is Dr. Richard Scotch, Professor of Sociology, Public Policy, and Political Economy at UT Dallas. His teaching includes courses on medical sociology, social stratification, and social and health policy, while his research focuses on social policy and social movements related to disability, health, and education. He currently serves as program head of the sociology and public health program and the criminology and criminal justice program in the School of Economic, Political, and Policy Sciences at UT Dallas. Dr. Scott, welcome. Thank you, Enrica. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, and, and I'm excited to, to learn from our, our guest and uh, uh, my colleague. Uh, we have a really, I think, exciting program tonight uh, and very relevant to the times we face. Uh, our, uh, our, our speaker is, is Dr. Chris Boone, uh, who is, uh, has a career history as an innovative thought leader and a public voice in the power of real world evidence, health informatics, and big data analytics, and its ability to radically transform the global health system into a learning health system. He's currently the Vice President for Global Health and Health Economics and Outcomes Research at AbbVie, and he's also an adjunct assistant professor of health administration at New York University at uh, the Robert Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. Um, he also has been vice president and head of global medical epidemiology and big data analysis at Pfizer. Uh, but I got to know Chris uh, as he was uh, uh, taking a pause from his impressive uh, uh, career in data analytics and health policy uh, when he got his PhD with us in public affairs here at UT Dallas. And I had the privilege of working with him on his doctoral dissertation uh, and uh, where he looked at how big data analysis uh, can be applied uh, to issues of, of health policy and health quality and cost uh, as uh, bringing a lot of uh, practical knowledge as well as uh, technical expertise. So uh, you can see the slide today. He's going to be talking to us about faster, better, cheaper, the changing role of real world evidence in drug development. So uh, let me uh, uh, turn to Chris now and uh, I look forward to hear what he has to say. Great. Thanks, Dr. Scotch, and uh, thanks for the very warm introduction, and thanks to you all for uh, jumping onto this webinar session. And uh, it's an honor to be here, uh, certainly an honor to, to kind of bring things full circle. I mean, I started uh, a lot of this research in the PA program uh, in, in the EPS school, and uh, it's great to see how things have advanced so much in the seven years since I, I've gotten this degree. But for the, for the purpose of this discussion today, what we really want to talk about and, uh, and what's really come to light in, the, in, this, in, the, in this pandemic is really the need to do clinical trials, clinical discovery and clinical development, certainly much faster than we have in the past. And, um, and really what I wanna talk about is really the need to accelerate the use of big data analytics and how we do uh, clinical discovery, development and commercialization of drug therapies. Uh, and what I like to frame as the post COVID world, even though we're, we're still in it. So, uh, so we'll jump right into the slides here. All right. Um, you know, I guess, you know, this is always something that the lawyers at um, at Advi would make sure that I uh, state that the uh, thoughts and opinions here expressed are really my own. Um, now, if they're brilliant ideas, then Advi would take full credit. Uh, if they're a bit moronic and, and not so brilliant, then uh, then they'll place all the onus on me. So uh, so just know that that's really what we have to do. Um, but just so you know a little bit more about um, Advi. Uh, the company itself just uh, recently 
uh, integrated or acquired another company called Allergan, uh, which is based out in California, to now become a $50 billion company. Prior to that, Advy as a standalone company was a $33.3 billion company formed in uh, 2013 as a spinoff company of, of Abbott, Abbott Labs. Um, currently, the company has roughly 30 products in mid and late stage development or under regulatory review, roughly 60 programs in clinical research and development, um, more than $120 million in community engagement and philanthropy that supports um, black uh, black communities. And I put that, you know, because we're now living in this era of the Black Lives Matter movement. 32% uh, of the workforce um, is comprised of historically underrepresented populations, and there's roughly 47,000 colleagues around the world. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, this is something that obviously the, the company itself has really proud itself on being uh, its commitment to uh, many of the, the racial injustices that we've seen. Uh, and we're addressing this in a number of different ways, to be honest. It, uh, there's, there's obviously a commitment in its recruitment and retention of talent from these various populations, but there's also a commitment to clinical trial diversity, which we'll talk briefly about here shortly. Um, this idea around reducing health disparities and, uh, and of course, its continued commitment to philanthropic support. Now, what you should know about me is that um, you can probably tell, even though I worked for, you know, worked in DC and worked in New York, at Pfizer, and I'm now in Chicago with AV. Um, I am from uh, from Dallas originally, born and raised. Uh, I, that makes me a big uh, Dallas Cowboys fan. Uh, but but you also should know that I really pride myself on number one being a patient advocate. Um, and health informaticist, social scientists, and a futurist in this space. And what a futurist really means is that we're able to think about things in much more of a systematic or systematized uh, fashion. You know, we look at uh, public policy and, regu and, and um, regulatory policy and how it's driving an industry. We look at technology trends, market trends, so on and so forth globally to really understand how the, how the world is evolving and how, how things are changing in order to really advance the science. And so really, uh, I spend the vast majority of time in, in my own head thinking about how do we uh, position things and how do we better maximize uh, things such as big data analytics to uh, accelerate the clinical discovery and, and uh, clinical development aspects, but also how do you take uh, drugs to market and make it accessible to these uh, populations that otherwise would not have access to it. Um, but another thing that's important to note is that I did start my career in health systems. I was uh, pretty determined to be the CEO of a public hospital, such as a Parkland, if you will. Uh, you know, got into the uh, healthcare system, realized, wow, this organization is very, very political, um, and it didn't, and this didn't feel like it was, uh, it would best utilize my skills. And I made a pivot, um, started to work more in nonprofits, uh, consulting organizations, and now in biopharma. But as Dr. Scotch mentioned. I do uh, Moonlight as a professor at NYU Wagner School, uh, teaching courses around health IT policy, health informatics, uh, data analytics and the like. And um, I get the great uh, fortune of serving on many, many boards. Uh, and you know, I actually had the great opportunity of serving on uh, President Obama's uh, Federal Health IT Policy Committee uh, back in 2010, 2011, where we were really focused on the development of meaningful use. Uh, a great experience for me uh, and you know and have done some many cool things uh, thereafter so just a note about that uh, but as for the rest of this conversation what i will do is spend a little bit talking about COVID 19 not too much we'll talk about some of the challenges that we're facing in the world of drug development how rural evidence can uh, address some of those issues if not many uh, where the current standing of the fdr are and then we'll kick it back to dr scotch for questions but just uh, just you know, I love this depiction, this cartoon where we talked about this era of digital and data transformation. And many folks thought that it's you know, and especially when it comes to pharma, it was it's years away. There's no way we're going to disrupt how we think about drug development. But then COVID hit, and uh, and you can see how we're having we're busy in our conference room, and then we have this COVID nineteen cannonball that's coming right at us. So we were never we were never expecting that. But then when you think about COVID nineteen. Um, you know, I would be remiss to not um, acknowledge, uh, you know, some of the disparities we're seeing uh, when it comes to the aggregated death rates uh, for COVID-19. Um, and it's, it's not lost on any of us and how we start to address many of these issues. But what you see is that uh, one in uh, whenever one in 1,020 black Americans have died, one in uh, roughly 1,200 indigenous uh, Americans have died. Uh, 
uh, one in 1400 Pacific Islander Americans have died, one in 15, a little bit over 1500 Latino Americans have died, one in 2000, one in 50 white Americans have died, and then you see one in 2470 Asian Americans have died from, from this disease as we know it today. Uh, but just to give you any uh, a little more facts and figures about the impact of COVID-19, and these numbers were pulled from the WHO on Monday, so they, they probably need to be a bit refreshed uh, to reflect where we are now, but roughly 21% of those uh, global COVID-19 cases are in the U.S., and 20% of the deaths are in the U.S. as well, so a pretty significant number when you think of the global numbers. Um, but there are 201 COVID-19 vaccine candidates under development right now, with 30 of those being in the human trial phase. Uh, we'll talk briefly about how the actual clinical trial uh, process actually works here in a second, so you'll get a better appreciation for what that means. But that does not mean that there are over 200 candidates in, um, in the actual human uh, trial phase, nor does it mean that you will see over 200 vaccine candidates that actually uh, hit the market and are available to, to many of us for, for vaccination. Um, but you should know that, uh, you know, in terms of, I guess, public perception, uh, right now the public perception of the pharma industry is, uh, or life sciences broadly, is at an all-time high. Um, you have 72% uh, of these confirmed vaccine projects are being led by pharmaceutical companies with another 28% by academics and, and other public-private partnerships. 341 potential therapeutics are under investigation right now for COVID-19, and, and you do see that the uh, U.S. government led by NIH has, has really focused its efforts on three candidates, three vaccine candidates under the uh, Operation Warp Speed, uh, which would be the Moderna, um, the University of Oxford, and AstraZeneca's uh, molecule and, and Pfizer um, and BioNTech uh, molecule, which you probably heard more about. Uh, but generally, from a real-world evidence perspective, there are several key questions that we think could help accelerate um, the development of this drug. And you know, if you think about it, one of it, which is the disease characteristics. So, what are the early and unusual symptoms that we may indicate that someone has been affected with the virus? Early on, we thought that this disease was more limited uh, to or more affected the elderly community and the um, infant uh, populations. Um, obviously, we've learned since then that that's certainly not the case. Um, another thing, as we, we just discussed, we start to look at the social, economic, and demographic factors of the populations that are most affected by um, COVID-19. And we talked about the uh, wide variability you see across uh, racial groups when it comes to uh, you know the COVID-19 uh, prevalence rates. Uh, but then also when it comes to the safety and eff efficacy of therapeutics, which is going to be extremely important. So even if we accelerate uh, the development and approval of a vaccine and a treatment. We also want to be able to monitor its safety and efficacy or effectiveness in real in a real world population, which is where real world evidence comes into play. Now let's just jump into the challenges that we know. So when we think about the FDA and their drug approval process, uh, you're, 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 you're looking at roughly 14 years on average to really develop a drug. And so what we're saying, you know, and, and the thing that you have to have an appreciation for is we're saying that we're trying to develop a vaccine and what would be arguably less than 12 months when it normally takes roughly 14 years on average, right? And um, and I think the um, CEO of Pfizer has been very public about the fact that it's cost uh, roughly $2 billion to develop this vaccine, which is well within the, the average range for developing a drug. But if you think about uh, drug development in a normal process, you have that basic science and research, which takes two to five years. Preclinical testing, which is a, 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 what one would say animal testing, if you will, uh, which is one to two years. Then you have the actual clinical trials, which are broken down into three different phases. The first phase is just really trying to tell you, is it safe, right? Uh, are we able to use this drug? Then phase two is, testing it in individuals with the actual disease, which takes roughly three years. And then phase three, which you really start to get in where real world evidence really takes shape, is when you're doing much more of a larger scale testing in individuals. And that's where we see the greatest opportunity to disrupt the clinical trial process and really uh, compress that time frame uh, to make it much shorter and, and thus get to approval faster. Um, as I just said, the average time and cost needed to develop a drug is 14 years. Um, approximately $2.6 billion, but a thing that you have to know, and goes back to that 201 vaccine candidates that you know I alluded to earlier, 
less than 10% of those therapies that enter human trials actually make it to the pharmacy. So you have a one in 10 shot of those vaccines actually working and proven to be safe, getting regulatory approval and then making it to the market in order to treat patients. So that's the real uphill battle. And that's really why there's an all hands on deck when it comes to all the researchers and trying to get a vaccine that we know that works. Um, I, you know, again, you know, kind of going into this idea around clinical trial diversity, which I know has come up, uh, ex uh, you know, many times in the in the context, even if thinking about vaccines and treatments, you see the level of uh, uh, prevalence in the, the various racial groups. It's going to be equally important that we have that level of diversity and representation in the trials to know how effective these uh, these therapies are in the, any given population. Um, there were uh, some numbers that were reported out um, by uh, uh, by the FDA that said in 1997, 92% of the participants in these clinical trials were white in human trials. Um, then you fast forward to 2014, 80%, 86% <laughs> of those participants in these trials were white. Obviously, that's not a reflection of the real world and it's not a reflection of, of the US population when you think of uh, getting uh, uh, drugs tested in these various groups, um, but we'll talk more about why that's important. So, you know, when you think about um, a disease such as multiple myeloma, uh, you know, African Americans make up 20% of US multiple myeloma patients and are twice as likely as white Americans to be diagnosed with it, but they only accounted for 4.5% of participants in multiple myeloma trials since 2003. Now, we think that there's an opportunity to really start to address these issues. Now, there is a number a number of issues as to why and factors as to why you see these numbers and why there is a lack of particip uh, participation of underrepresented minorities in, in human trials. Um, but the point is, is that as we think about COVID-19 and any other future pandemic that we may have, we have to address this issue of lack of representation from all groups and all genders um, in, uh, in human trials. But nonetheless, it led uh, one of the senior leaders over at the FDA, Janet Woodcock, Dr. Janet Woodcock, to, to make the statement that she believes the clinical trial system is broken um, and is in need of uh, a certain level of modernization uh, that we can hopefully address uh, when it comes to big data analytics and many of the advanced analytical technologies such as artificial intelligence uh, in the future. And, uh, and we all know that diversity in clinical trials equals good science plus better medicine. Uh, just really quickly, and I'm going to start blowing through some of these slides because I want to make sure that we are able to get to the Q&A. Um, but, you know, one of the questions that people have is why should I care about real world evidence and big data and, and how does it make a difference? Um, I think that this quote pretty much encapsulates it best and it, and it reads, having transparent, shared and scientifically validated evidence of therapies that work for patients in a real world setting will better enable patients, providers, payers, and regulators to make more informed decisions about the most medically appropriate and cost efficient treatments for patients. This statement alone pretty much sums up the division that I lead at AbbVie and what we're trying to do is generate evidence that pretty much will substantiate or validate what we think, how our therapies work in a real world context for all these different stakeholder groups. Now let's talk about real world evidence. Right now you're probably wondering what exactly is real world evidence? You keep saying that. Um, well, you think about it now, we're, we're in this digital era that we live in. There's a number of different data sources uh, that are being generated that capture um, health data and what we know about people and the environments in which they live. We now have electronic health records, which is our clinical data. We have this medication records that, um, which are, you know, when your doctor is is saying, you know, it's prescribing you a certain medication. They have that and in CVS, they fill the medication and all so on and so forth. You have this claims data that is usually what's used to process payment for the services you receive. But now we have this interesting time where 23andMe and many of these other genetic profiling companies are have bubbled up and they're now telling us more about our genetic profiles than we ever knew before. We're able to use that data to better understand patients and those who would benefit most are, are probably at risk for side effects when it comes to certain therapies and we want to look at that. We want to look at family history. We want to be able to look at this uh, data that is telling about social activity and the environments in wh which people live. The interesting, thing, the interesting thing about environmental data is that, you know, as the head of the CDC that said, I can, you know more about the health of individuals based on their zip code than their genetic code. So we want to be able to understand the environments in which people live and then that's where policy comes into play to be able to address those things, whether it be crime and safety and education levels, so on and so forth. 
another area where we're looking at is patient reported data. Um, the data that we're getting from um, surveys and you know uh, food diaries and uh, personal health records in that. And then you believe it or not, we do um, do sentiment analyses on social media data that we see and how people feel about it. And of course, we look at all the extensive literature that's out there about certain diseases. Um, now, real world data itself holds the promise to substantially increase the effectiveness and sufficiency of all processes in the development and utilization of medicines from, rec from research and development to regulatory decision making, pricing and reimbursement decisions uh, to use in medical practice. This actually comes from the EMA, the European Medi Medicines Association, and their position uh, on the expanded use of real world data. Now, why is real-world data uh, especially appealing today? I think there's a number of factors. Obviously, there's policy. There's regulatory policy specifically. You have the Sentinel Initiative with the FDA. You have 21st Century Cures Act. That was a bipartisan bill that was passed. You have the PDUFA uh, 6 bill. That's uh, obviously something that's being enforced by the FDA. But you also have this vast amounts of data that are being generated. We just talked about it. Clinical data, biological and molecular data. You have this real world structured and unstructured data, um, but then you also have these abilities that we never had before where we're looking at artificial intelligence and how we can use to to model um, and we don't necessarily have to use uh, the placebo effect when it comes to uh, some of the trials that we're, we're uh, that we've conducted or we sponsor. But clearly when it comes to market drivers, the pace of scientific innovation is accelerated. There's rising development costs. I mean, I told you two point six billion dollars. Um, to develop a drug, increasing availability of data, importance of patient centricity as the as the healthcare system shifts and pivots to being much more patient centric. Now I know you're probably wondering, like, well, if you weren't patient centric before, then what exactly were you? Well, the idea now is to make sure we incorporate uh, the patient voice into um, clinical care decision making and even to clinical research. Uh, we learn more about the the patient experience and how we should be driving. Uh, cl clinical research than we ever before. Then there's this emphasis on value. Um, you know, it's not it's not more so around a, a more fee for service. It's more of a outcomes driven uh, healthcare system is where we uh, where we are today. And there's a number of initiatives that have have uh, substan substantiated that. Um, now, real world data when it comes to a pharma company will be used to optimize trial design, speed trials by aiding an investor investigator in site selection and will enable new trial designs by acting as virtual control arms and supporting pragmatic, adaptive, and, and real-world evidence registry trial designs, um, which is a, a pretty cool innovation. But if you think about how we use big data and real-world evidence in pharma across the life cycle and drug development process uh, that I uh, discussed earlier, we, we use it for clinical discovery, where we want to understand the, the standard of care and the disease burden and unmet need. We do it from an operational perspective where there's around this trial feasibility. Does it make sense to do a full blown trial? Uh, will that give us the insights we need and the evidence needed to get regulatory approval and uh, and so on and so forth? There's a need to understand the, the safety. There's a need to understand the value and the commercial. But then there's another piece of this that's really driving everything, and that's around patient and provider decision making. There is a desire to close the gap of the evidence being generated for regulatory approval versus the uh, evidence being generated for clinical decision making. Historically, they have not been the same, right? What the FDA has wanted and what a provider would actually use to make, uh, you know, their own cl clinical decisions at the bedside are not the same. And uh, that's an issue that we have to address, which gets into the learning healthcare system approach. Uh, there are a number of challenges that are associated with it that you know, uh, can be categorized as cultural, ethical, regulatory, and even financial barriers to this idea around using data um, for clinical research and, uh, and clinical decision making. Uh, but I, but I want to just kind of bring your attention to the one that's dead in the center of this, which is this whole lack of trust issue. Um, at the end of the day, there are privacy issues, there are security issues, there are um, you know issues around monetizing one's data and patients not having ownership and so on and so forth. But the reality is what people are most fearful of is the lack of trust when it comes to healthcare providers working with pharma companies, healthcare providers working with payers, patients working with pharma, so on and so forth, the whole dynamic. And we have to address this issue around the lack of trust and, and realize that we're all on one team in order to improve the overall public health and, um, and everything that's, that entails.
Um, so really, we're going to blow through this next few slides. Um, so, so for me, the next the North Star is that we need to close the evidence gap between the information we use to make FDA decisions and the evidence increasingly used by the medical community, by payers, and by others charged with making healthcare decisions. This is a quote from Scott Gottlieb, who's the former uh, FDA commissioner, who is actually very instrumental. Uh, Rob Califf, uh, Commissioner Califf, Dr. Califf, was w the first commissioner to really catalyze the use of rural evidence. But I think uh, when it came to Scott Gottlieb, he had this unique ability to really make it make sense to everyone. And um, and we saw some significant traction under his, his two years of leadership for the FDA. Um, and the future lies in this ability to form these, to address these issues with trust and form these, what I feel like a cross sector partnerships with all the different actors uh, in this complex system that we know um, as the healthcare ecosystem globally, not just even in the US, but globally. Um, and when you think about the use of um, electronic health records and quality registries and, and so on and so forth, they really can uh, effectively help us reimagine what clinical trials ultimately look like. And, uh, and you know, with the vast amounts of data that we have now and this focus on patient centricity uh, and this renewed interest from all the different actors to form cross sector collaborations, we think that this is a great time to really start to close the loop on how we think about discovery, development and, uh, and actual use of medical therapies in the real world context. And this is really to say that the vision for a learning healthcare system, which was uh, uh, the Institute of Medicine actually launched a series of workshops where they were focused on how to operationalize this in the US. And you know, when it comes to a using EHRs to create a learning health system, this is essentially how it works. You know, that the research question is there, these different perspectives, the regulator, the HTA body and payer, provider groups and manufacturers all have this perspective and question that they want to see answered. Uh, well, they seek uh, this EHR data, which gives actionable information about the patient encounter or their additional visits. We then you, we analyze that data, it brings it back. We produce some sort of evidence that then becomes part of the clinical process and it feeds it back into another question. So you're seeing, you're, you're seeing a closing of the feedback loop when it comes to how evidence is generated and how we use that to formulate uh, new, uh, new and uh, better questions. If you're thinking about practically how this works and this idea of, of, uh, of health systems and biopharma partnerships, you know, you can look no further than MD Anderson down in Houston, which uh, formed a partnership with Bowring and Ingeheim around the idea of lung and gastrointestinal cancers, right? And they were essentially creating this multi-year partnership where they were going to they were going to study these two uh, particular cancer types and the therapies that were used um, on patients and how they could uh, uh, best understand the mutation of many of these uh, diseases in, in, in tumor types, um, but also collecting enough evidence that would ultimately, um, uh, you know, whether they want to seek uh, regulatory approval or cl improve clinical protocols and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm not going to spend as much time here, but these are different use cases of how RWE can create value across development. And, uh, and how we think of it from a regulatory approval, but I will bring your attention to this. There is this idea of accelerated approval of COVID-19 vaccines. So if you look at post-market studies, that's really where um, you wanna focus when you talk about RWE. We wanna get this accelerated approval here, but we wanna be able to get RWE to understand the efficacy, the safety and effectiveness of these drugs once they're out on the market. And that's really what we're gonna be looking for. Um, certainly over the next decade or so. Um, you know, when I was at, uh, here are a number, this is precedence for where real world evidence has been used in regulatory decision makings in lieu of, uh, of a randomized clinical trial. And um, I was uh, privy to be part of this IBRANS, which is the bottom right corner, uh, which is a drug that uh, Pfizer develops. And it's happened while I was still at Pfizer, where we use real world data to get approval of a, uh, of a drug that was used for breast cancer in women to get it to be get it, uh, to get an accelerated approval to have that drug used in breast cancer for men, which is actually a rare disease, but it does exist. Um, my vision for the world is that we have number one, the guiding principles. We have more trust, um, more collaboration. Uh, we have a greater culture that embraces data sharing analytics. But what I really want us to do, and the thing that I've I've greatly uh, appreciated about the COVID nineteen pandemic, if there is a silver lining is that the way that the global uh, community has rallied together 
to address a single problem. And it, you know, and everyone invests their resources, their people, their time, their brain power to really address the global pandemic. I think those are the types of, uh, that's the type of thinking, that's the type of uh, commitment we need from the global community to really uh, push uh, uh, humanity forward. And so that is really what the shared uh, vision is. Um, and then you have a develop a joint plan of action to address many of these issues around uh, some of the systemic racism, inequality, social determinants, clinical trial diversity, the more practical things uh, around that would ultimately address that, uh, that would enable that shared vision to happen. And then I do believe we want to enable insights, which is just the expanded use of big data analytics. Uh, and that's what I have. So thank you for your time. Thanks very much, Chris. That was very informative. In a minute or two, we're going to bring in Dr. Price, uh, but I, I wanted to just uh, follow up with you about this issue of trust. Um, I think the main barrier uh, of science has been to develop an effective vaccine. And as you point out, there's been a tremendous amount of collaboration on that. There have been a huge amount of resources put in. Uh, but still, if we ask the public, or if we ask many policymakers, there's not a lot of trust that what will be presented to us as a vaccine will be safe, will be effective. So is there some way we can uh, use uh, the lessons from big data to promote more trust in the healthcare system by, by patients, by the public, uh, even by healthcare providers? Uh, so if you could speak briefly to that and then we'll uh, bring in Dr. Price. Yeah, I think there's there's that's uh, two two responses to that. The first thing is that I, you know I was I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see the uh, the commitment from the various pharma companies who all signed this uh, promissory note that said that we are committing to generating the highest quality evidence based on the most rigorous science um, in support of the vaccine and its approval. So we want to. This is not about getting a a drug to market to make money. It's really around can we prove that this this therapy is efficacious uh, is effective in these various populations and it works and be transparent about the protocol the scientific protocols we've used and the evidence we've generated and so i think that trust is really in transparency you know and uh and and so it's the whole like trust but validate uh uh moniker that uh that we know ronald reagan uh, emphasized quite often and so i think in this particular case that's really what it's going to be the trust is going to have to be built on transparency Thank you. Well, let's turn to our other guest today, uh, Dr. Ted Price, who's the Eugene McDermott Professor in the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences. He directs the Center for Advanced Pain Studies here at UT Dallas, and he's a leading researcher on, on issues of pain and how, uh, particularly among people with chronic illness, and how that works at the molecular level. He's also very relevant to our discussion today someone who has been instrumental in developing new medications to address the problems of pain. So Dr. Price, if you could comment on, on uh, Chris Boone's presentation and your experiences as someone trying to bring a, a product to market in the pharmaceutical field. Sure, thank, thank you, Dr. Scotch. Uh, Dr. Boone, that was a really terrific uh, presentation, so thank you for that, I, re I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I think, you know, um, your last point about uh, transparency, I, I think, is just super important. It doesn't have anything to do necessarily with what I'm saying, but you know, I, I, I also was uh, moved. I, I'm somewhat sad that we're in the position that the pharma companies had to come out with this document because I think you know that their the, the trust is being in some ways undermined by federal policy, which is sad. Um, but I think it was absolutely the right thing to do, and was also un unprecedented. And I think you know. The, it's nice to see that they understand that uh, transparency and what they're doing here is ultimately how we're going to build public trust. I, I, I just really hope that it will work, um, but I, I think it's the only way to really do it. Um, I, I I work in the in the pain field, and uh, you know we, we uh, the, the big epidemic that people talked about before the team came about was the opioid epidemic, and and we were uh, we still are really actively engaged in trying to develop uh, new uh, drugs to help people with with pain. P pain is one of the biggest problems, medical problems in the United States by most estimates. It affects about a third of the population. And as people in our country and, and 
other places around the world uh, continue to live longer and also uh, survive diseases that used to to kill them. So, Dr. Boone, you talked about um, new new approvals for cancer. Uh, th th those are wonderful, but unfortunately, m many people that survive cancer will have pain problems. And you know, one one thing that many of us in the pain field are focused on, um, among others, is trying to create a world where where they don't have to be exposed to opioids to help one, them with their pain problems, so that they don't you know survive cancer, have a pain problem, and and then develop uh, dependency or potentially addiction because of their exposure to these. Uh, pain medicines, so that, that's a big goal of what we do. I also know this is a big goal of what Abby does, so kudos to you guys for being very actively involved in this uh, particular area. I'll, I'll just bring one example uh, of how we kind of use real world data. So, you know, part of what we do is developing new drugs. Another part of what we are actively engaged in is trying to repurpose drugs. So Dr. Boone, you also talked about this, something that, that I've worked on with people at MD Anderson, and which you also mentioned MD Anderson, is uh, trying to come up with, with drugs that could potentially help people with chemotherapy-induced neuropathies, which is a major problem that people have when they're receiving cancer treatment. And we, we found uh, that uh, metformin, a, a commonly used di diabetes drug, uh, can prevent uh, many forms of chemotherapy neuropathy in preclinical models. And we're, we're doing studies now in conjunction with, with another uh, company um, looking at real world data because millions and millions of people around the world take metformin uh, and some of them surely are getting chemotherapy treatment. So we're, we're using clinical, uh, electronic clinical or medical records to try to find whether there's real world evidence that metformin can be repurposed for, for this. And if it turned out to be successful, it would be really great because metformin is a very cheap um, it's, and, and very, very safe drug that could be given to people when they start chemotherapy treatment that could prevent them from developing neuropathies, which would greatly reduce um, their uh, long term health burden after they survive the cancers, which most of them will. So that's uh, one example of how we're using this kind of data. So I'll turn it back over to you. Well, uh, let me uh, pull out some uh, issues that have been coming up in the chat, and I would encourage everyone uh, who's listening to this uh, to post your questions uh, into the chat uh, so that we can uh, uh, pose them to uh, Dr. Boone and Dr. Price. Um, a couple of the comments have dealt with uh, return to this issue of trust, in particular with uh, some of the pharma companies that have not always been uh, as trustworthy as we might have expected historically. And I think that's particularly true for uh, minority communities who have uh, uh, experienced uh, experimentation that might not uh, have been to their benefit. Uh, or who has, as Dr. Boone has pointed out, uh, have been excluded from clinical trials in the past. So um, how can real world data help us to restore uh, uh, trust? And, and how can we uh, assure people that we are behaving ethically, both uh, here in the United States and, and globally as, as we develop these new products? Yeah, I mean, I think, um when you think about the lack of representation in many of the clinical trials, you know, you start to look at many of the factors or what, what say social factors or social determinist factors that are affecting one's participation if they so desire, if they desire to be part of a clinical trial, right? So let's look at it from that perspective first. I think, um, you know, you start to look at some of the logistical challenges. Many of these clinical trials have been uh, essentially run by uh, academic medical centers and some of your leading academic medical centers and very urban epicenters in the US, right? But that's not, you know, so then one would have to, if you live in a smaller town or city, or even if you live in a rural community, you would have to then commute yourself to uh, many of these um, clinical trials at these academic medical centers. I think that what has been quite fascinating is to see the, uh, the increased use of what one would say are decentralized or virtual trials. This idea of using digital technologies to allow people to stay where they are and we can passively or remotely or collect data about the patients and their health conditions and their responses to many other therapies as part of a clinical trial. I think that that will help address these issues. But when it comes to the mere act of trust, right, um, which is deeply ingrained in many of these minority com uh, communities that have been 
deeply affected and uh, afflicted by um, historical uh, uh, situations and we don't have to recount them all. I think that, that is really where the reality is. I don't care how much you speak to it. I actually, you know, I'll tell you, I'll share a great story with you, Dr. Scott. I was actually uh, talking about clinical trial diversity at the Congressional Black Caucus two years ago, and I was in front of this audience of uh, predominantly African-American doctors who were with the National Medical Association. And I was, you know, speaking uh, really, and I was still at Pfizer at the time, so I was speaking to the group and I was really trying to say, we really need to improve clinical trial diversity. Will you partner with me, with us, in order to make this happen? The, lo the level of reticence that I saw from the doctors themselves uh, was uh, was a bit astounding, and they had a number of reasons why they said. Number one, we're already overwhelmed uh, with this our you know work that we have to do as part of our clinicals. The number two, um, you know, we don't feel like we're well resourced, and many of the patients we treat are are, are strapped with so many um, you know issues in their personal lives where they can't afford. Uh, they don't have transport. They have transportation challenges. They have an affordability issue when it comes to getting access to therapies and so on and so forth. So there are so many issues that are beyond what we would say are, um, you know, the scope of what a pharma company has done uh, in the past that would have to be addressed. But it, I think these issues can be addressed in conjunction with providers if we acknowledge A, they're there, and B, we have a true commitment to wanting to see greater participation. But then you also have to commit yourself to being transparent, fully transparent about what you're doing and why you're doing it. The thing I get most concerned with is now you're hearing many people say, sure, there's a vaccine being developed, but I'm not going to take it. You know, you had Elon Musk say that just two days ago. And, uh, you know, and so the more you hear people talk about this issue and the more we, uh, you know, I had my mother who knows nothing about drug development start to speak about herd immunity, Dr. Scott. Herd immunity, I'm not even sure she fully understands what herd immunity is, but but because they're hearing it as part of the political rhetoric that we have, which gets really dangerous, I think that um, uh, we're going to find ourselves. So there is some social cultural issues to address in addition to this kind of the practical operational issues with running a, a clinical trial and um, and we can't do it alone, right? We have everybody has to work together to make this happen. Let me let me bring in yet another uh, concern and issue that comes from the chat. Uh, uh, someone named Derek posted uh, the issue of of concerns about privacy and and consumer data collection. Uh, we have this great potential to collect all this data that can help us uh, create more effective uh, treatments uh, and uh, and track them. But there is also a lot of skepticism among the public about whether their data will be used appropriately, uh, particularly with for-profit companies that might try to exploit the data they're uh, collecting uh, for uh, their own purposes that may not always uh, align with the, the needs of consumers. So uh, what kinds of assurances or what kind, how can we promote trust about that our data will be used appropriately to get people's cooperation, either of you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, we saw GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation out in, in the EU, which was very stringent about the use of data and what people and how people control their data. I've actually been supportive of the idea of having a similar policy um, in the US that I think would empower uh, consumers or people to be able to essentially control what they do. But I think what we do from just the biopharma research and that of a real world data, big data perspective is ensure that there's, um, you know, uh, clear consent practices being enforced. Um, the one thing people can can take some solace in is that pharma companies themselves, the only data we really hold and control is clinical trial data. So all the big data elements that I showed on that slide are not data that's being generated or curated by us. We generally have to work through a healthcare provider or some tech company or someone else, some partner, in order to get access to that data. What we do enforce is the idea of ensuring that they have gotten proper consent from people. The issue though, Dr. Scotch, is that how many people actually read these consent statements? When you sign up for iTunes or whatever you use, um, <laughs> and it gives you that long agreement in terms and conditions, people just scroll to the bottom and say, I agree, right? And so they don't even know the extent of how the data is being used. So we have to find a way to simplify that language for folks to ensure 
they understand fully what they're agreeing to. But I'll pass it back to Ted for. Thank you. Look, let me pose a, a little different question. But Dr. Price, you can go back to any of the issues we've been talking about. Um, as someone who's struggling with the product development issues, uh, there's been a lot of criticism of federal regulatory uh, uh, overbearing, perhaps, on uh, this development product process. But at the same time, people are concerned. So. Do you think uh, we can hit a Goldilocks of not too much regulation or not too little regulation? Are we at that point now, or what? What do we need to to think about there? I, uh, I, mean, for, I, I just from from a drug development perspective, I mean, you really have to understand safety, e even if the drug is going to end up not being safe. So uh, let me give you an example, right? So if if, if somebody has an has an inoperable and otherwise terminal cancer. They they will uh, uh, tolerate a, a much uh, a bigger potential uh, list of side effects than 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 somebody that has a hangnail, and uh, but you still have to know through the regulatory process what are the safety issues that are going to come come across, or there's no reason to develop the drug because the the scientists and physicians and and the patients themselves need to understand what uh, what they're getting into when they're taking a drug. And so from my perspective, I, I think this is why the FDA has been recognized around the world as, as the gold standard agency, because they have, they're extraordinarily stringent about understanding safety. So from my view, uh, uh, regulation can be a, a little bit burdensome, I guess, in terms of the amount of paperwork and everything that you have to do in your interactions with the FDA. But in, in terms of the, the scientific process, my, I, I think it, it's just right because we, if, if we don't understand as much as we can how the drug interacts with the biological system to create the effects that we're going to observe, you know, not only in reducing the disease burden, but also in causing side effects that are going to come along with the drug, then there's, there's no hope for us in, in developing these therapeutics. We have to understand those things. Thanks. Let me... Uh pivot a little bit here. Uh, another one of our PhD alums, uh, Dr. Melinda Hicks, uh, uh, posed a question in, in the chat. She's uh, now working as an academic advisor here in, in the School of Economic, Political, and Policy Sciences. And she writes, as an advisor, I sometimes have students who are interested in these issues and want to pursue careers that will contribute to solutions. What abilities and skill sets do you recommend that students focus on that will prepare them to enter the big data uh, RWE space? Um, Dr. Boone or Dr. Price, do you have any suggestions to uh, people who would like to uh, take advantage of the opportunities for big data analysts? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I'll say this field is probably one of the more multidisciplinary fields that you can find. Um, folks have come from all walks of life, whether they come from a, uh, you know, like if I think about my organization and, and the academic training of many of the individuals, they come from clinical training backgrounds where, uh, you know, they were either nurses, doctors, whatever. Um, they could come from much more bench scientist backgrounds where they were trained in, or, or more the physical sciences, biology, uh, chemistry, you name it. We have folks that are trained in uh, certainly more of the social sciences, whether they be folks like me uh, or even folks that come from an economics training uh, background or even, um, you know, uh, certainly we have folks that are pharmacists. We have folks that are uh, software engineers. I mean, you know, the, the reality is, is this. There is not when you when you talk about big data analytics, there's not a single profile for an individual or student that they can come into it. And honestly, even as you're part of a team, you'll find that this team is multidisciplinary and people come from different training, but that's actually what makes the insights much richer, right? Um, I think, um, you know, one of the greatest benefits I had is my commitment to um, healthcare as an industry from the very beginning of my career. So I think that industry insight and how that the insights you're generating are being utilized is probably more valuable than just the technical uh, skill or, you know, well, we've hired folks that were pure data scientists and I do think they have a role, but the issue is, is that 
if you're going to conduct this analysis and you don't fully understand what you're analyzing and why and what and how to interpret the findings, then you're really of not much value. So I, it's easier for me to then take someone who understands why we're in uh, trying to generate this evidence and train them in the data science uh, uh, skills needed. And then that would actually be much more of a value add to me. So my advice to folks is to understand the industry or context at which you're trying to generate the insight and evidence and apply those skills accordingly because honestly the the translator skill is probably uh you know the most valuable to most organizations let me ask the same question similar question to dr price you uh play a very uh, important leadership role in our neuroscience uh, uh program here uh training scientists to go out uh, and pursue careers. Um, how can we uh, educate the public more uh, about uh, science? Uh, and how can we train scientists better to be able to communicate with the public? Um, can you think of any particular strategies or examples? I mean, yeah, I, I think I think it takes practice uh, for one thing. So one, one thing that we try to do is to create more opportunities for our uh, neuroscience students and training, in particular our, our graduate students, to uh, interact with people that don't necessarily know the the field that they're working in, and to you know help them to to talk clearly about what they're doing without using jargon. So um, that that's important. Um, uh, I guess. Uh, going back to what Dr. Boone was talking about, you know, I, I think it's also really important for people when they're thinking about what they want to do when when they uh, leave their training to get varied experiences while they're graduate students because it'll, it'll help them tremendously. So I, I, I completely agree with what he was saying about, you know, having a, a rigorous training in data science and statistics is extraordinarily useful, but if you don't understand the context from where your data comes and what you want to do with it, and you know, in healthcare, that usually means that you need to understand something about healthcare. You need to un understand a little bit about biology, maybe a little bit about pharmacy and pharmacology, etc. That's really hard. So, you know, I, I try to help students to understand not to get too siloed um, in, in your thinking and, and continue to expose yourself to diverse areas because it's really going to help you uh, a lot in, in growing your career. Thanks. Um, we only have a few minutes left uh, in this hour. I wonder if either of you have any closing comments you'd like to make uh, about some of the issues we've looked at today. Well, I'm, I'm actually really curious about uh, what Dr. Boone would think about a question that was po posted in the chat, actually. So this comes from Dane Richardson, who is one of our moderators, but he says, with millions uninsured or having limited access to affordable therapies, how is real world da data bringing drugs to the most vulnerable? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, it, is a, it is a great question. <laughs> Uh, you know, and um, you know, but really, I think that what real world data does for us is gives us a better insight into um, truly what the problem really is. I think that before it was all anecdotal. I mean, I think we assumed that certain populations were being underserved and um, we could assume we knew where they were. Um, but I think the level of precision that we get from uh, from uh, from much of the data and the data analytics that we're doing now is very helpful. We get to understand who those patients are, what profile they are truly, and where they are. And then we can actually develop interventions to address them. And you know, we've done a number of things around um, if affordability is the issue uh, when it comes to you know access to therapies, then we have these copay programs that we establish. And if you look at any of the AVI or even Pfizer commercials, they make it a point to say, if you have an issue with affording these therapies, please reach out to us and we have these copay whatever programs that we have that are out there. Uh, but then you have this actually this issue of just lack of awareness that these therapies are out there too, right? So it's kind of not, you know, when you think about um, access, uh, it's really around, do I know that this drug actually exists and I can actually have access to it? Uh, then it becomes, does my provider, uh, are they willing to prescribe me this therapy because they go through their different uh, protocols on how they, you know, will be a first line therapy versus second line and so on and so forth. Um, then you have this issue of if I'm insured, then does it cover it? If I'm uninsured, then how can I afford it? Um, there's just like a number of variables that you work through, but I think that um, in all in, 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 in good faith, I mean, we've all tried to develop these interventions to uh, 
to mitigate those issues. Um, I, I, you know, I thought that an interesting approach uh, from Pfizer and their CEO when it comes to the essentially rollout of the um, the the vaccine is that he, you know, his approach was I'm going to sell it to governments all over the world and leave it to them to then ensure that their populations are, you know, their citizenry are, are getting access to this therapy. Uh, now, how effective that is, you know, we don't know, right? That's maybe a program evaluation question. Mm -hmm. uh, but, 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 you know, if you think about it, if you don't do it that way, then what's the alternative? You're really just relying on the individual providers to use their own discretion as to if and when patients should have access to the medicines or the vaccine in that particular case. So I think that um, what the access to all the various data types that we have gives is, is much more of a precision marketing or, uh, you know, uh, sort of play where we can better understand patients who are most afflicted and what we can actively do to address uh, those issues. And, and, and by all means, we're all doing that. Whether people want to believe it or not, we're actively doing those things. And, and I can tell you that uh, my organization is very involved and very committed to that as well. I'd like to just make add a comment of my own in here. Uh, as someone who's involved uh, uh, with uh, helping to educate pre-medical students, I think the role of healthcare providers, Dr. Boone has already alluded to this, uh, is really critical. Uh, we had another dissertation in public affairs uh, by uh, Dr. Marcin Royster, who looked at uh, African-American men in Dallas. It was a qualitative study and how, whether they were uh, uh, adhering to uh, uh, practices that would maintain their health. And she found that one of the key factors was whether they trusted their providers. We need to have physicians and other healthcare professionals who can understand the science, but also communicate effectively with patients uh, to promote uh, uh, that kind of trust we've been talking about uh, today. And often that uh, depends on uh, 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 how they're educated, uh, how providers, it, it didn't matter so much as, as to what kind of uh, uh, background the, the doctors had, but whether they treated patients with respect. And unfortunately, we're, this is another day perhaps, uh, but we're, our healthcare system is such that uh, doctors have less time to spend with patients and uh, uh, perhaps don't know them as well and so our healthcare system is going in a direction that makes it harder to maintain trust rather than better. So uh, I think we need to wrap this up. We're about out of time. Uh, uh, I, I think the people uh, uh, watching this will see our next event. Uh, so I wanted to just thank both of our presenters, uh, Dr. Boone, uh, Dr. Price, and uh, all of the people uh, in the research office and communications office who, who put together today's program. Thank you so much to uh, Dr. Boone, Dr. Scott, Dr. Price for sharing your time, your knowledge, your resources with us today. Thanks to everyone in the audience for attending and participating in the conversation. Have a great afternoon, everyone.